My name is Dr. Ajay Singh. I am um, Program Director for the Intensive Review of Internal Medicine Program. I'm a nephrologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Senior Associate Dean for Postgraduate Medical Education at Harvard Medical School. I'm going to present to you Board Review Practice Images 2020. This is my disclosure slide. Question one, a 58 year old white male from Cape Cod sees his primary care physician with a lesion on his forehead, which he noticed approximately two months previously. He's otherwise well and his examination is normal. The picture of the lesion is provided. Uh, the most likely diagnosis is A, freckle, B, melanoma, C, Merkel's cell cancer, D, basal cell carcinoma, and E, keratoacanthoma. I'll pause for a second. The correct answer is um, basal cell carcinoma. So let's review skin cancer. Some facts about skin cancer. Non-melanoma skin cancer is the most common cancer in the US. And basal cell cancers uh, approximate around 75%, so three quarters of non-melanoma cancers. The incidence of non-melanoma skin cancer is increasing in some areas of the United States. And indeed, risk factors include sun and ultraviolet radiation exposure, including tanning beds, a history of sunburns, a light complexion and eye color, so light complexion, uh, fair skin that freckles and burns easily, uh, and uh, light colored eyes, blue, green, or other light colored eyes, and light colored hair, red or blonde, increase the risk of non-melanoma skin cancer. Family history or personal history of BCC, uh, basal cell cancer, squamous cell cancer, tinic keratosis, familial dysplastic nevus syndrome, or atypical nevi also increase the risk. Um, chronic cutaneous inflammation is another risk factor. Immunosuppression, particularly if you have um, undergone organ transplantation and are on immunosuppressive agents. Uh, and then among environmental exposures, exposure to arsenic increases the risk of non-melanoma skin cancer. This is a um, schematic representation or pictures of different forms of cancer. And you see melanoma uh, at the very top uh, and there and compare that to an atypical mole there on the bottom. Squamous cell cancer um, shown here, basal cell cancer, um, and uh, you see the appearance of Merkel cell carcinoma. So really, this is a whole um, spectrum of different types of cancers. Um, but the most common cancer to take away is the basal cell cancer here, which is in this case sort of a nodular cancer um, with irregular margins. Uh, and compare that to the squamous cell cancer, which is this ulcerating cancer, also irregular margins. Focusing on basal cell cancer, um, there are numerous types of basal cell cancers, nodular, cystic, uh, pigmented, morphic, or infiltrative, and ulcerative. The most important feature is that of the margin definition. Is it clear or ill-defined? It rarely metastasizes, unlike squamous cell cancers, which metastasize to regional influence. They tend to be slow growing, locally invasive, whereas in contrast, squamous cell cancers are faster growing, and they usually affect white people. And so here are examples of this different types of appearance of these type of cancers. Um, question two, an 18 year old young man presents with a three day history of acute onset, violaceous, painful toes. There's no association with cold and there's um, no transientness to the discolor discoloration and there's no rash and no arthralgias. Past medical history is essentially negative. Hands and fingers are unaffected. Uh, the CBC, SED rate, COAGs, D-dimer, CHEM7, LFTs, ANA, um, urinalysis are all within normal limits. And the COVID-19 RT-PCR is negative. And you can see here, this is just a representation, um, these cold chilblain like toes in this individual. So the most likely diagnosis is A, Raynaud's phenomenon, B, acrocyanosis, C, COVID-10 infection-induced chillblains, D, lupus-associated skin vasculitis, and E, thrombotic microangiopathy. And I'll pause for a second.
So the correct answer is COVID-10 infection-induced chilblains. And of course, you're saying, well, the RT-PCR was negative, so therefore it can't be that. Uh, and I would remind you that in the midst of um, um, a potential pandemic, um, anybody uh, can be viewed as potentially positive, especially since we have many tests uh, that are currently uh, on the market, uh, which come up with false negatives. Also, in many of these cases, actually, in the literature of this chilblain-like COVID-19 associated lesions, the RT-PCR has been noted to be negative. So just be aware of that. So just a quick review of Raynaud's, Pernio's, and acrocinosis. So Raynaud's is characterized by paroxysmal episodes of triphasic or biphasic color change white, red, and bluish discoloration of fingers and toes. In this patient, the discoloration was fixed, so it would not be Raynaud's. And there's no history of this biphasic or triphasic change in color. Chilblain, or ponio, um, develops after cold exposure in digits with er erythematous and purplish discoloration. There's itching, burning, and pain, which is often present. And that contrasted with acrocinosis. And there's often edema of the digits and tenderness. So, this patient uh, could well have, in its differential diagnosis, chilblains, which is not COVID-related, right? Um, the, the, the other condition, acrocinosis, uh, is a persistent abnormality where you get deep blue or cyanotic discoloration of the skin over the extremities uh, because of decreased oxyhemoglobin. Um, these patients often have a functional peripheral vascular disorder. It's more prevalent in children and young adults, usually under the age of 30. Risk factors include cold climate, outdoor occupations, low body mass index. And there are a variety of causes. And when somebody gives you a variety of causes, you know that it's not really clear that we know what's going on. But auto, autoimmune causes, malignancy, uh, and so on and so forth have been invoked. Diagnosis, the only test that really can be, di can be diagnosed is a capillaroscopy, which visualizes the capillary venous stasis. So in, in this patient, um, you did really have um, a di uh, you did really not have an um, association with um, chillblains uh, that's non-COVID related. This patient didn't have a Raynaud's phenomenon because of the lack of biphasic or triphasic changes. Acrocinosis didn't seem typical. Um, lupus associated serologies were negative. Thrombotic microangiopathy, there was nothing in the lab data that supported it. There were also no splinter hemorrhages uh, that were seen. This is a paper, a uh, case report, uh, one of the early case reports. This happened to be published in 2020. Uh, and you can see this redness here in this uh, individual and these violaceous infiltrated plaques uh, with typical features of tumor brains. So COVID-19 toes, some, some information about this. Several skin manifestations have been linked with COVID-19 infection. It occurs mostly in adolescents and young adults uh, who are otherwise asymptomatic. Several hundreds of cases or sets of quote, COVID toes in the US have been diagnosed through teledermatology. Uh, presentation, uh, typically classic red to publish discoloration on the dorsal aspect of, of the toes, um, sometimes with small nodules. Uh, less common are these circular or ring-like lesions on the plantar or lateral aspects of the feet or toes and, and involvement of, of fingers, uh, in contrast to the frequent involvement of fingers in traditional pernia or chillblains. Um, you may get superficial blisters and erosions. Uh, lesions may be asymptomatic, but many are pruritic or painful, particularly when touched. And toes may be swollen and too painful to wear, or to wear shoes. Lesions uh, typically last 10 to 14 days, but several have been reported to be persistent for a few months. And biopsies to date have been consistent with pernio. Uh, and in fact, there are many PCR negative cases that have been reported. So COVID-19 toes is something you should think of in the midst of this COVID pandemic. It's, it's typical uh, changes uh, in young people, but remember that RT-PCR may be negative. So beware of that. Question three. It's a 52 year old homeless man on chronic dialysis with a history of non compliance who presents with chest pain. Chest x ray and EKG show the following. You can see the chest x ray here, and you can see the electrocardiogram here. And I'll give you one minute, one second to just absorb that 
chest x-ray and EKG findings. So the next step should be A, administer prednisone 60 milligrams per day tapered for over one month. Uh, B, per emergency pericardios pericardiosynthesis and initiate heparin-free daily dialysis. C, anticoagulate the patient immediately with heparin. D, administer colchicine and E, administer vitamin B6. And you can see this, the, the heart here looks like there is, uh, it's expanded or enlarged in size and this appearance would be very typical of a pericardial effusion. Uh, and you see here uh, the rhythm of electric alternans. Um, and so the, so um, most likely the diagnosis here will be uh, um, a pericardial effusion. And the question really is what's the right treatment? So I'll give you uh, a second uh, to make your decision. So the correct answer is emergency pericardiosynthesis and initiate heparin-free dialysis, daily dialysis. So this patient actually has uremic pericarditis with tamponade. So pericardial effusion from the pericarditis and then tamponade. Um, pericarditis occurs because in this patient, in these patients, uh, because inflammation of the visceral and parietal membranes of the pericardial sac tends to occur in patients with BUNs are greater than 60, but I've seen it in patients who are malnourished with BUNs lower than that. Um, risk factors include inadequate dialysis and or fluid overload. Um, patients often present with fever and pleuritic chest pain that's worse in the recumbent position. Uh, pericardial rub is generally audible, but is frequently transient. Uh, patients may have signs of cardiac tamponade, particularly in those who have rapid pericardial fluid accumulation. Um, and importantly, the EKG does not show the typical diffuse ST and T wave in uh, elevations that are observed with other causes of acute pericarditis, such as Dresler syndrome, which you see post-MI. Uh, and this is because there's a lack of penetration of the inflammatory cells into the myocardium. And here you see the EKG of electrical alternate sinus tachycardia with B to B variation, the QRS appearance that's best seen in V2. In V2. You can see that. Question four, an 88-year-old woman sees you for her routine physical. She uh, feels fine, she says, but on a review of systems, she does admit to tiredness that is relatively new and onset, uh, uh, which is approximately three months in duration. Uh, she denies any stool per rectum. She says her diet is mostly vegetarian and she's been eating less than she normally does. Vital signs are normal, blood pressure, in fact, 130 over, 132 over 80. Uh, she has pale mucosa. Otherwise, everything else is normal. Lab data, hemoglobin 8.9, hematocrit 27%, mean corpuscular volume, MCV 65, mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, that's the MCHC is 26%, RDW is 16.7%. The blood smear is shown up on the right-hand side. I'll give you a second to just absorb that. And the question is, choose the single best. A, an, an anisocytosis, B, hypochromia, C, poikilocytosis, D, microcytosis, and E, all of the above. I'll pause for a second. And the answer is all of the above. So this patient has, you can see the different shapes and sizes, anisocytosis, you see the hypochromia, you can see small cells, which is microcytosis, and you can see the poikilocytosis. So some anemia, some facts. Um, <clears throat> uh, hypochromia, patient has is pale red cells. Microcytosis, they're small. Anisocytosis, unequal. And poikilocytosis, abnormal shapes. You can see that. Um, the degree of anisocytosis roughly approximates the red cell distribution width. And you can see that uh, it would be expanded. So the next step here would be perform iron studies, TSAT, ferritin, fecal occult blood, and colonoscopy, because what you suspect is that this patient is iron deficient. And why do you say that? Well, she, firstly, she's been tired. So that's probably consistent with anemia. Uh, she's it's been relative onto it. Her diet is probably the thing that's most important. She's been mostly vegetarian and she's been eating less than normal. And so that's probably the reason why she's become anemic. So this is um, often people uh, in, in Europe call this the tea and toast diet. This um, 
schematic shows how you manage or think about iron deficiency anemia. Iron deficiency anemia here at the top, you, you look for a clinical history, you look, uh, you, you do the appropriate tests, um, and you divide people into premenopausal women and men or postmenopausal women. And premenopausal women, uh, you're really looking for various things, and ultimately you're ending up in uh, thinking of investigating the patient if it's suggestive of gastrointestinal intestinal disease, gastroscopy, if it's lower gastrointestinal uh, disease, colonoscopy, and the absence of sim symptoms, you think about um, treatment with iron and gyne gynecological evaluation. In men or postmenopausal women, pretty much you go right to gastroscopy and colonoscopy in a single session. Uh, usually if it's normal, you treat with iron. Uh, otherwise, you try to come to the diagnosis, which uh, and the differential includes gastric or colonic cancer, celiac disease, or other diseases. Question five. So this is a 42-year-old African-American male who works as a janitor in the city bus station who presents with a history of cough, dyspnea, and a fever of three days duration. He's a smoker with a past medical history of hypertension being treated on two medications, amlodipine and lisinopril. On examination, he has a temperature of 38.5, blood pressure 108 over 55, heart rate of 118, a respiratory rate of 26, and an oxygen saturation of 92%. His lungs are clear but with reduced air entry. The rest of the examination is unremarkable. Chest x-ray is shown on the right-hand side. Um, CBC shows a white count of 5.2 with a normal diff, a uh, hematocrit of 44%, and CHEM7, which was within normal limits. The most likely diagnosis is A, atypical pneumonia, B, acute bronchitis, C, COVID-19 associated pneumonia, and D, toxic exposure to cleaning liquid. I'll pause for a few seconds. So the correct answer is COVID-19 associated pneumonia. And you see on this chest x-ray here uh, of this male uh, that there is this subhylar infiltrates here, which on CT would appear as ground glass infiltrates. Um, usually, and most commonly, uh, CT scanning in conjunction often with uh, testing are used to make the definitive diagnosis. Now let's move to the next um, uh, issue, which is a COVID-19 snapshot. And so shown on this slide uh, is, uh, is the viral structure for COVID-19. And, and you see that um, COVID-19 has the spike glycoprotein, S glycoprotein, and this is responsible for receptor binding and membrane fusion. And this is also where what, what the target would be for host neutralizing antibodies, such as when you, we're giving convalescent serum, this is what you're going to be target, we're going to be targeting. There's an envelope uh, protein, um, which is called an E protein, which is in fact important for virus infectivity, and matrix or M glycoprotein, which is the most um, abundant structural protein and interacts with E, uh, the envelope protein, to form the viral uh, envelope. When you look at the life cycle, the S1 will bind to the ACE receptor. Um, the host serine protease will, uh, TMPR SS2 cleaves the viral S, allowing fusion of the viral and host cell membranes. And so you get this endocytosis, uh, and then it goes into these vesicles where uh, this then uh, replicates. Um, in fact, the, um, the uh, vir a viral fusion inhibitor, chloroquine and hydro hydroxychloroquine, was hypothesized to interfere with this step. And in fact, in many studies now, um, has been demonstrated not to um, have any impact on COVID-19. We don't have any randomized control trial, but hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine does not appear to work. In contrast, um, Remetisvir, which is an antiviral RDRP inhibitor, uh, it, it acts on replication of, of COVID-19 here. And there are other antivirals also that might be important. Now, the immune response, um, uh, th th there are really three things you need to take away. One is that there's an innate immune response that's activated. Uh, here you have delayed or suppressed type 1 uh, interferon response during the initial infection. And then viral replication triggers a hyperinflammatory uh, hyper condition and a cytokine storm, which then results in influx 
of activated neutrophils and inflammatory monocytes and macrophages. And what you then get is a serum neutrophilia and elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines, which then correlate with severity of disease. And in our patients, it was probably too early to see any of that. There is an adaptive immune response, um, which is shown in this next box, where the a T helper, TH1 and TH7 um, cells are, TH17 uh, cells are engaged. Uh, and here, IgM and IgG are usually detectable within two weeks after infection. Lymphopenia may in fact be related here to bone marrow suppression. In our patient, we didn't see that. So la laboratory findings in mild disease, there's lymphopenia, which is usually quite common. There's leukopenia, and there's an increase in CRP. Moderate to severe disease, you get abnormalities in liver function tests, an increase in CK, an increase coagulopathy with a D-dimer that's increased, increase in an acute phase reactant in ferritin, and increase in an LDH. Uh, and so that's, and when you look at the treatment, you can see that some of the treatment might be focused at uh, countering these, these, um, these uh, cytokine effects. Uh, and the use of convalescent plasma serum may be also involved in, in this. Uh, so the clinical course, uh, transmission is usually by primary droplet, um, and which may be aerosolized. Uh, this is prevented by hand washing, uh, alcohol uh, washing, so this would be, you know, the Purell's, PPE, and, and social distancing, and epidemiologically containing this through isolation. Um, symptoms include most patients uh, like our patient that I presented, um, majority have fever, um, but only in about 40% of patients at the time of diagnosis. This is why it's quite interesting that we're using fever as a screening tool. Uh, remember that only 44% of the patients will actually have that at, at diagnosis. Um, dry cough in about two thirds, fatigue in about 40%, sputum production in about a third, uh, dyspnea in about 20%, and then these other symptoms. And this gives you the tempo of disease, the severity on the uh, vertical axis, on the horizontal axis is time. So you initially have the viral response, and then that's followed with the host immune response. Uh, in most patients who have symptomatic infection, mild to moderate infection, fever, cough, and they'll often, most people will get better with this. In those who have a hyperinflammatory response, you get an ARDS, an organ failure, uh, and some uh, patients will recover, as, as we know from the New York experience, only about 15 to 20% of patients who get uh, into the ICU on a ventilator actually end up uh, uh, recovering. Most, uh, unfortunately, very high mortality, those patients who get into the critical phase of this illness. Uh, question six, this is a 68-year-old woman who has a long history of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, RA, which one of the following uh, deformities is not characteristically seen in RA. So you see um, uh, the, the, the hands here. Uh, and so the questions are A, Boutonnier deformity, B, swan neck deformity, C, ulnar deviation of the uh, metacarpophalangeal uh, joints, D, Bouchard's nodes, and E, mallet finger. And I'll wait uh, for a minute or so while you, while you um, make your choice. So the correct answer is Bouchard's nodes. So this, these are the osteoarthritis hand abnormalities. And so Bouchard's nodes are actually what you see in osteoarthritis, not in rheumatoid arthritis. And osteoarthritis has two different types of nodes. Heberden's nodes here shown here uh, on the distal and here in um, Bouchard's nodes. And this is the bony abnormality here. In rheumatoid arthritis, in contrast, you get the mallet finger, you get the boutonniere's deformity, uh, you get the swan neck deformity, and you get the ulnar deviation, uh, particularly in those patients late stage. You often don't see this now because of, of, of the very advanced forms of therapy, disease-modifying therapies that are available for treating of this disease. Question seven. Serum levels of which one of the following laboratory tests would be expected to be most abnormal in this patient? A, 17-hydroxyprogesterone, B, uh, angiotensin-converting enzyme, C, anti-tissue uh, transglutanamase trans antibody, D, prolactin, and C, and, and E, vit uh, vitamin B6. So this is the patient you see here. Uh, you see these abnormalities um, 
on the face here and on the nose. And this is the lung, uh, uh, the radiological features uh, on plain uh, uh, chest x-ray. I'll wait for a second. So the correct answer is angiotensin converting enzyme. So this patient has lupus pernium, and this is a manifestation of sarcoidosis that involves the nasal bridge and the cheeks. So you see the nasal bridge here and the cheeks. And the chest x-ray shows hyalur uh, bi um, uh, lymphadenopathy, which is bilateral. Serum levels of the angiotensin converting enzyme in, uh, and are elevated in the majority of patients with untreated sarcoidosis like this patient. So some information about ACE levels. ACE levels may be elevated in approximately 60% of patients at the time of diagnosis in these patients. Um, Non-caseating granulomas, NCGs, secrete ACE. Uh, and so the enzyme is secreted by epithelioid cells at the periphery of the granulomas. And the level is usually elevated in patients with active sarcoidosis. Serum ACE levels may correlate with total body granuloma load. Levels may be increased in the fluid of patients that's extracted from bronchoalveolar lavage or from the cerebrospinal fluid, also seen in patients with miliary tuberculosis, silicosis, asbestosis, biliary cirrhosis, uh, leprosy, and so on. So in patients who have, um, who have um, non kca granulomas, you can see elevated ACE levels, and you can see it in many different types of patients. Sensitivity, therefore, and specificity as a diagnostic test is limited, 60% sensitivity, 70% um, specificity. So there's really no clear prognostic value. But serum ACE levels um, may decline in response to therapy. And so uh, some people have believed that, well, perhaps we can use this either diagnostically or from monitoring treatment. But really, the the the, the message that you should take home is that decisions on treatment should really not be based on ACE levels or on uh, alone, uh, it's, uh, but based really on a variety of things, clinical manifestations, radiological manifestations, and uh, serological manifestations, including ACE levels. Question eight. What's the most likely diagnosis here? A, amyloidosis, B, celiac disease, C, hypothyroidism, D, Kawasaki's disease, and E, type two diabetes. And this is a patient's tongue here, uh, and you're asked for one of these five options. I'll wait for a second. So the, so the correct answer is B, celiac disease. So this patient has an atrophic glossitis, and this is a typical manifestation of patients with celiac disease. Um, so in a, in a paper published um, a while ago in, in the foreign literature, um, the tongue was the most frequently affected site in a series of 128 patients with celiac disease who were examined for oral mucosal lesions and symptoms. And at about 30%, um, patients described soreness or burning or burning sensation, and about 9% having erythema or atrophy. And so you see this here, this is a glossitis in this patient, and, and these patients can have quite significant symptoms. So other manifestations of celiac disease in the oral cavity are shown here, uh, in, uh, are shown in, 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 uh, on the slide. Um, dental and enamel defects of varying dis dis degrees of advancement, and these include discolorations, horizontal grooves and pits, and structural destruction of the uh, dental crown, uh, defects in various parts of uh, the teeth, uh, uh, ulcers, uh, the oral mucosa and delayed tooth eruption. So, so dental abnormalities in, um, are particularly important to keep in mind in patients with celiac disease. Here's another example here. This is an aphthous ulcer here, and this just shows you some discoloration and uh, of, of, the, of the teeth. Question nine. This 53-year-old college professor could no longer lecture because of her tongue, uh, because her tongue kept getting in the way. Her tongue was enlarged and had serrations, uh, reflecting imprints of her teeth. And you can see that in the picture here, of uh, these uh, serrations that show imprints of the teeth. Her upper torso muscles were grossly hypertrophied, seen on this picture, and hard as wood, quote unquote. The most likely diagnosis is A, acromegaly, B, hypothyroidism, C, amyloidosis, D, pernicious anemia, or E, an allergic reaction to toothpaste. And I'll pause for a second.
So the correct answer is amyloidosis. So this patient has um, an enlarged serrated tongue, which really does suggest amyloidosis. Hard for you to see, but uh, the serrations are typical, and the tongue does seem a little large for this uh, uh, mouth opening. Um, but the differential diagnosis could be also acromegaly or hypothyroidism. The giveaway is the shoulder pad sign, uh, which is specific for amyloidosis. That's the combination of an enlarged serrated tongue with a shoulder pad sign is pathognomonic or systemic amyloidosis. Now, what about localized amyloidosis? So uh, the tongue is most frequently affected site in um, patients with localized amyloidosis. Uh, a tongue biopsy possesses a really highly diagnostic value for amyloidosis. However, there's no consensus regarding the management of lingual amyloidosis, although there have been numerous therapies that have been proposed, including surgical excision and pharmacological treatment. However, the lesions often persist or, or recur. Question 10. This is a 68-year-old man with a history of aortic stenosis, status post mechanical prosthetic aortic valve, who's noted to be anemic. A peripheral blood smear is done, and um, you're asked to match the correct image to the diagnosis. And this is the image here. So moving to the next slide, you see the image here. The image shows A, schistocytosis, schistocytes, B, um, howl, body, howl jolly bodies, C, sickle cells, D, burr cells, or E, normal cells. So I'll give you a second to ponder this. So the correct answer is schistocytes. And you see those sickle cell-like um, ab abnormalities here. This, this patient has, this is like, um, uh, almost like helmet cell, but this, this, um, the image shows schistocytes. So just, uh, getting uh, getting uh, really um, uh, uh, concrete here. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the uh, abnormal morphology, and you see schistocytes, which occur in patients with a microangiopathic um, hemolytic anemia. And if you see this shape and size here, and if you look at this, this is what you see here. Um, these, these, there are many other abnormalities, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but it is worth spending a few minutes on these different morphological features. The Howell Jolly Body is, uh, is, is shown in a cartoon image as this, and it's an inclusion of DNA associated with hyposplenism, asplenism, or severe hemolytic anemia. If you see um, um, burr cells, uh, burr cells are shown here. Um, these are uh, the, this abnormality, which are artifactual. So I'm gonna do this again, uh, Joe, uh, because I missed, messed around a little bit, okay? So question 10, um, the correct um, answer is schistocytes. And you see the schistocyte here on this image. Um, and as I'll explain in the next slide, you do not see how jolly bodies, sickle cells, burr cells, and this does not appear a normal smear. This next slide shows you the different morphological appearances of red cells. And if you focus right in the middle here, schistocyte is this appearance, and you can see what I showed you. Um, burr cells was also mentioned, but we did not see that. Um, these are um, um, uh, cells that either are artifactual or occur in patients with ure uremia or liver disease. And we did not see Howell Jolly bodies, which are this um, uh, little inclusion from DNA. And we did not see sickle cell uh, RBCs either. So this patient uh, has uh, schistocytes. So I'm going to stop at this point. I want to thank you for your attention.